Well, we did it, everyone. We made it through another cinematic movie year, and I saw a lot of movies. Some of them were great, some of them were not so great. And it is time to give my ranking of my 10 favorite movies of the year, as well as my 10 least favorite movies of the year. In this video, we are gonna talk about the best of the best, in my humble opinion, and in a separate video, I will list my least favorite movies of the year. But let's keep things fun, let's keep things light, and let's celebrate what 10 movies stood out the most for me personally. Now, these are my 10 favorites. I know some of them might not have been winners for everybody across the board, but these are the ones that spoke to me the most. Before we kick off my top 10 list, I just have five honorable mentions because these films deserve a shout out, even if they didn't quite make my top 10 list. And so my five honorable mentions are Luca, A Quiet Place Part 2, Raya and the Last Dragon, Malcolm and Marie, and Jungle Cruise. All of these movies were fun and they had their moments in various ways. They're all very different and they all left an impression on me, even if they didn't quite make my top 10 list. So let's kick off my top 10 favorites. We're gonna start with number 10 and work my way up to number one. And in my number 10 spot, we have Shang-Chi, The Legend of the Ten Rings. This is probably the best Marvel origin movie I have ever seen. I was incredibly impressed with the world building. The action set pieces were phenomenal, but the characters were also incredibly likable. They were relatable and there was some very rich world building. And I thought that Shang-Chi presented something special uh, for the MCU that we hadn't quite seen before. And it definitely was the standout Marvel movie that came out this year for me personally. And in my number nine spot, we have James Gunn's The Suicide Squad. Talk about a beautiful redemption story. Even if it's not so much the same case at the box office, I'm sorry, but the first Suicide Squad movie was, was just a hot piece of trash and they made some gems out of this new movie. Thank God for James Gunn and his directorial talent to really give us what the Suicide Squad should have been from the very beginning. This script was so much fun. The characters were fun. Yes, the humor was foul, but these are villainous characters. I thought it was only appropriate. I love the ragtag team of misfits. James Gunn certainly knows how to do that. This movie was a rampage of unpredictability and I had a very good time. I love the R rating, which gave them free range to really do whatever the fuck they wanted from violence, language, humor. That's the kind of free range you need for the Suicide Squad, and I felt like they didn't waste this opportunity. Even if it was a box office dud, I still feel like this movie is a critical success for the DCEU. And in my number eight spot, we have the Mauritanian. Now this movie was completely sidelined and looked over uh, for the Oscars in the previous year. The cast was impeccable. I felt like this movie um, was went tragically unrecognized across the awards categories for best picture, for uh, uh, best actor, or maybe even supporting actors for Jodie Foster. I loved it. Uh, the fact that it was based on a tragic um, but brutal true story is just mind-boggling to me that's in our recent uh, nation's history. Not enough people saw this movie. You really need to go check out The Mauritanian. Very powerful film. In my number seven spot, we have In the Heights, and I am so incredibly upset with how uh, how little the audience showed up for this movie because I thought it was such an impeccably done musical. I had never seen the stage production, but I thought that this musical was rich, the music was lively, the cast was vibrant. I loved seeing the vision of Lin-Manuel Miranda's musical brought to life, and I thought it was very well directed, very well executed. I was listening to the soundtrack all summer, and I feel like it's incredibly unfortunate, the lack of uh, audience that really showed up for this movie as well. In my number six spot, we have Being the Ricardos. Aaron Sorkin does it again. He is without a doubt my favorite screenwriter for film and television for that matter. And I have greatly enjoyed all of his movies and Being the Ricardos is no exception. Sure, it's no Trial of the Chicago 7, it's no Steve Jobs. However, I thought it was such a strong film. Nicole Kidman gives a, a, an incredible performance as Lucille Ball and it really pulls back the curtain in Hollywood around one of Hollywood's most famous, iconic couples and really telling the story in such a creative way with time jumps. It was so compelling, engaging from start to finish, a very tight script, great dialogue from Aaron Sorkin, very well acted across the board, especially Nicole Kidman, as I mentioned. Being the Ricardos really stuck with me and it strikes me as one of those movies that will only get better and better with each repeat viewing. And in my number five spot, we have 
Encanto, which stands as my favorite animated movie of the year. Encanto was such a, a, a beautiful, I don't want to say surprise, but in a way, a little bit of a surprise. I felt like the marketing, though, um, though engaging and though very vibrant, the marketing didn't do this movie justice. This movie is a gem. It is completely deserving of, of, of owning that mantle of being the 60th animated Disney movie ever made. It lives up to that title. It brings such rich, beautiful diversity and messaging around people who feel less significant or, or, or not special like everyone else. It made me cry multiple times. It's Disney really bringing its A game. And when you have the creative team that brought the likes of Tangled and Zootopia working on this film, it's no shock to me that they handled this story and these characters, this original story, unlike anything we've ever seen in Disney history, very, very well. This film sticks with me. The music is lovely. The characters are insanely lovable, but it is so rich to behold. It's a beautiful message around family. It's a beautiful message about embracing who you are, even if you are feeling insignificant compared to others. It's about finding value in those that don't feel as special. So oftentimes movies focus on someone who is born special with a unique ability, but what about those that aren't born with a special ability like everyone else and are made to feel lesser than? It's a beautiful message and shout out to the first quote unquote Disney princess with glasses because Mirabelle is fucking adorable. And in my fourth spot, we have Cruella. Now, this is how you do a Disney villain origin story without losing what makes the villainous side so juicy and iconic. They didn't water it down, they didn't dumb it down, they didn't completely change it up and change the entire core of the character, unlike Maleficent in my opinion. Emma Stone was impeccable as Cruella. She became an icon and I feel like she gave just as an iconic performance as Cruella as Glenn Close did as Cruella different performances, especially at different stages in Cruella's life, if you think about it, but they're different in their own ways. I love the creativity um, in explaining Cruella's origin. I love that they didn't just automatically make her a, a hero and advocate for PETA, because that's what they would have done if they had gone the Maleficent route. It gives such rich layers to the Disney character, and this is a dark Disney film. This is a bold Disney film, and with how PC Disney really has gotten in recent years, I'm very, very happy that they allowed this creative team to give this movie as much of a Joker treatment as they possibly could to maintain a PG-13 rating. And in my number three spot, probably my most controversial film on this list and really high up on my list is Dear Evan Hansen. Haters gonna hate, and this movie has gotten a lot of hate from critics to general audiences. Say what you will, Ben Platt did an amazing fucking job in this role and in this movie. I recognize that he looks older than a high school student, but um, how many Hollywood films have had full-blown adults playing high schoolers? I mean, come the fuck on, people. That part didn't bother me because Ben Platt did such a great job. His acting was impeccable. He did not waste a beat, and he brought some real raw vulnerability to this role, he didn't overact like oftentimes Broadway actors will do. And then for those that have problems with the story, it's like this is like a, a Tony nominated, Tony winning musical. Why wasn't there this amount of hate over the story back when it was, you know, riding high on at the Tony Awards? I've heard the issues and complaints expressed by many, many people about the story, and I did not have that experience. I had already grown to love the score. I'd listened to the entire soundtrack before. I hadn't seen the stage version, but I knew beat for beat almost basically what the story was. So nothing was really surprising to me, especially having heard the music, and the music is phenomenal. Everyone also acts their heart out in this movie. I will say there are a couple of performances that weren't perfect. You know, I love Amy Adams, but she wasn't perfect. But the main core leads like Ben Platt and Caitlin Deaver, their chemistry was fantastic. They captured the essences of these characters uh, impeccably. I love some of the changes they made from the Broadway show to the movie. I don't understand the hate. And if the hate mostly stems from a, from a qualm with Ben Platt looking too old for the role, I'm sorry, but get the fuck over it because I feel like there is so much more that this movie offers than people give it credit for. To each their own, 
I enjoyed it a lot. It resonated with me on a deeper level and I, we can all agree to disagree, but I don't understand the hate for this movie because it resonated with me, it got through to me, and I loved so much of it. In my number two spot, probably one of my biggest surprises of the year, and that is Last Night in Soho. Thomas and McKenzie and Anya Taylor-Joy are phenomenal. Um, Thomas and McKenzie, especially giving off what I feel like is her first real true leading lady role, is sensational. Now this movie shocked me. I did not go in expecting to love this movie as much as I fucking did. The cinematography, the production value, every single shot felt pristine. I loved the thriller mystery elements of it all, and it gets pretty freaky, especially in the last third of the movie, and I genuinely had no idea where it was going, but the powerhouse performances from the two leading ladies really drive this movie home. Last Night in Soho was such a fun, enticing, juicy surprise of a film that really needs to be experienced. And I get that the ending might be controversial to so many people, but I found it personally tremendously satisfying. And in my number one spot, my favorite movie of 2021 is Supernova, starring Stanley Tucci and Colin Firth. This movie cut me to my core as I saw it. That's not to say that this movie is depressing. I think this movie is beautiful in depicting a long-term relationship and a, and a deep-rooted love um, in this couple. It deals with um, one half of the couple developing dementia and what that does to a person, but then also when you have someone in your life um, diagnosed with early stages of dementia and how that starts to affect them and how that trickles into your life and how it will ultimately affect your partner down the line, your partner of several years. It's not overblown. It's not melodramatic. These moments felt real. It just felt like real people in this situation and grappling with, you know, having an intense love for somebody and realizing that that is going to change and if not be taken away from you. And how do you grapple with that as you see that, as you see that person starting to change before your eyes, it sounds cheesy as fuck, but for those who have been in love with somebody, who have started to build a foundation with this person, when you're faced with that unavoidable conflict of, of losing someone and really just recognizing the best in them, recognizing what you had with them and how you can move forward from that and and be grateful that you had that love. This movie had me crying almost from start to finish, but it's not a movie that brought me down. It's not a movie that depressed me. Yes, it made me sad, but it made me empowered and it made me feel that love. I felt that love in that relationship and that's what got through to me in watching this movie. It's simple, but it's real and it's, it's powerful. And that's why Supernova is my favorite movie of 2021. And there you have it, everybody. It's been one hell of a year and there are so many movies that I've seen and yet there were some that I didn't get a chance to see and that's why they didn't make the list. But I would be curious to hear what your favorite films are. So feel free to leave your list down below or tell me what your favorite ones were. I recognize that we may have some differing opinions, but that's just fine. That's movie business for you. Be on the lookout for a separate video where I will talk about my 10 least favorite films of 2021. But for now, I'm gonna wrap things up and thank you all again for tuning in. And until next time, I am Ryan Bamey signing off. Bye everyone.